Welcome to the Tip TV Master Investor Show. I'm here with Victor Hill, one of our most popular authors. Victor, we are going Hi, to Sven. speak about. Good morning. We are going to speak about investing into agriculture today. Why should anyone be interested in something that sounds like a terribly boring subject on the surface? Okay, it's not boring. It's the biggest industry in the world. Uh, there are going to be 12 billion people on this planet by the end of this century, and they will all need to eat food three times a day. And maybe we could live without our mobile phones, maybe not, but we can't live without food. That's a very true point. Now, I understand from what we've been discussing that there have been huge changes in the agriculture industry in the last couple of years in particular. Can you talk us through some of these key changes that now make this, as an, make this an interesting subject for investors? Right. Well, I think there are a few key things going on, of which I would like to discuss maybe just four. Um, first of all, we've got the demographic uh, issue. Uh, the world population is expanding, it's growing, and it's expanding rapidly. So if you go back to when I was born aeons ago, the population of the world was two billion people. Right now, today, it's just over maybe 7.4 billion people. By 2050, it's going to be around 9.6, 9.7 billion people, and it will continue rising until somewhere between 2075, 2100, when it will peak at around the 12 billion mark and will then decline. So in <clears> our <throat> lifetime, we're definitely going to see it go past 10 billion, which is an extraordinary number. Almost certainly. Um, by the way, during that period, the um, dependency ratio is going to be increasing because the global population is going to be aging and growing at the same time. And there are all kinds of issues associated with that, which we can discuss uh, in another conversation. So we've got the demographic issue. Uh, we've got to feed the world. That's lot number of, one. That's the number one point. The second point is, of course, that we are actually running out of available, suitable, cultivable agricultural land. And this is a limited resource on this crowded planet, and they're not making any more of it. And, you know, if you go back to the last, in history, in the 19th century, huge swathes of new agricultural land came into production, such as the prairies in the United States of America, so that the world was able to rapidly increase the supply of food available. That's no longer available to us. And we don't want to cut down more well, rainforest. Well, unless we decide to cut down more forest. But if we do that, we pay a very high price namely in terms of accelerating uh, climate change and, of course, in damaging biodiversity. So if we want to look after this planet uh, intelligently, that's not a good uh, place to go. So that was number two. Number three? Well, the, the, the third factor is that we have undoubtedly climate change uh, upon us. Uh, it's already impacting itself. Um, let's not go into the science of global warming, but we know that the world is getting hotter and we can see that the glaciers are are melting. Um, we don't know how hot it's going to get or how quickly, but we can observe already that there is an impact from this. For example, if you take Australia, uh, which is a country with a, a relatively large agricultural sector, the uh, crop yields and the uh, productivity from the um, livestock sector has been declining as a result of uh, extreme drought and wildfires and other environmental uh, 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 consequences of global warming. So, so declining productivity of the existing land, that's that, number That is three. likely to happen mm -hmm. in large sections of the surface of the earth. That said, there are areas which may even benefit from climate change, and I'm thinking of places like Russia, where huge uh, parts of Siberia might be open for the first time to cultivation, uh, Canada, and even here in the UK, we might actually benefit, uh, short term at least, by having an extended growing season uh, for our crops and being able to cultivate a greater variety uh, of crops in question. Okay. So that was number three. What's number four? So we have a, um, a situation where um, effectively crop yields have been rising exponentially thanks to technology and science and animal husbandry and all these wonderful scientific advances that we've harnessed over the last 100 to 150 years. But it turns out, according to a peer-reviewed study that has uh, had a huge impact in the United States, one which I quote in the article, that crop 
yields are not growing fast enough in order to satisfy demand. So that uh, by 2050, uh, on the basis of extrapolating uh, in, in, increases in, in, in production uh, from the present, supplies of the four main cash crops, that's wheat, uh, rice, uh, maize and soybean, will be insufficient to meet demand. And that could be a problem. That sounds like it's going to make for a potent mix. And I have to admit, you've pretty much convinced me here already. Uh, tell us a little bit more also about something that you mentioned to me when we spoke earlier about the changes in calorie consumption around the world. I found these well, numbers absolutely fascinating, <laughs> very briefly. This is very interesting because actually um, food production has kind of plateaued in the last 50 years in the developed and advanced countries. but. It has, in fact, um, shot up in, for example, India and China, which over the last uh, 50 uh, years or more have uh, been able, for the first time in their history, to feed themselves adequately. So going back to the talk about Malthus, um, back in the tail end of the 18th century, the population of the world was about 900 million. By 2050, it's going to be more than 10 times that. But in addition, human beings are consuming approximately twice as many calories as they were 250 years ago, when um, English and, and French uh, laborers, according to one study, were consuming less than 1,500 calories per day, which is, which is starvation rations. Now, if you look at India and China, they were both uh, consuming approximately 1,400 to 1,500 calories of food uh, per day back in the early 1960s. Which wasn't enough. Which wasn't enough. They were going hungry. It's, it's starvation rations. But in China today, uh, they are consuming something like 3,200 calories per day. That's which an is, extraordinary figure. How much uh, are they consuming in the United States? 3,850 calories per day. That is also, that's even more extraordinary because the, the, the recommended consumption for a male human being is about two and a half thousand per day. Right, well, okay, roughly. it depends if you go to the gym every day or not. I mean... Um, which we all do, of it, course. Yeah, which we all do. Um, Indians consume about 2,100 calories per day. Great. Still, yeah. but obviously there's a huge yeah. diversity of yeah. consumption as between the countryside yeah. and, the, and, and the city. So the, the Americans consume 60% more yeah. food per head than India. Yeah. So what I've understood now is that we have to get more and more food produced on a planet that has stayed pretty much the same size. Right. Uh, in terms of specific opportunities, that's obviously what is of most interest to yep. the viewers of this program. I understand that there are a whole different parts of this industry that we could invest into. And I thought I'd, I'd, ask, with, I'd ask you first about something that is very much at the beginning of food production, yes. fertilizers. There yes, are a indeed. number of large fertilizer companies on this planet. Are there any that you can, well, you can recommend well, there in are. particular? I, I actually see I've identified opportunities all the way along the food value chain, which is an, a, a, an amazing part of the global economy. But in terms of fertilizers, Let's be clear, much as we might like the idea of organic uh, food, we cannot do without fertilizers and pesticides, which are closely associated with them. And judicious and um, wise use of fertilizers will continue to be a major part of the process of growing our food. Now, uh, this is a fairly mature industry. By the way, it's one where the major producers do pay dividends. The technology is, is reasonably mature, but I'm looking at a few um, producers in uh, developing countries and elsewhere who look to me to be exciting both in terms of their export activity and also because their, their domestic market is growing rapidly. One is Ural Kali of mm -hmm. Russia. Russian. And I, I, I might say that I think this is going to be a very good year for the Russian markets, and I think that we're going to see as it were, a normalization, if that's the correct term, uh, of relations uh, with Russia in the Trump era and with a, a French president of, of whatever color who is likely to make some rapprochement uh, with Moscow. So that's, that's one and interesting Euro Russian Kali stock. is one to watch. Yes. Moving further along the, the line of production, obviously there's always the possibility of genetically modifying food 
and food production in some kind of way. Indeed. Monsanto is now being purchased by Bayer in Germany. Correct. What can you tell us about that situation? And is, is Bayer maybe a company to look at? It's a very big one. It's a very liquid share. Bayer is a massive company which is at the forefront of a whole range of technical, uh, of chemical technologies. And it, it, thanks to the purchase of Monsanto, it will become the dominant player in GMO seeds. Now, these uh, seeds are controversial because they're sterile. And what that means is that once the farmer buys them, they have to rebuy the next year in order to replant their crop. So repeat business. So once you've subscribed to, to, to these, these products, you subscribe for life, effectively. You're paying the, the provider for the rest of it, which has been criticized. It is controversial. But the fact of the matter is that the yields are extremely advantageous. And, and presumably after mm -hmm. the merger of Bayer and Monsanto, this is going to be the number one company in this area to invest into. It will be. I don't think any diversified portfolio which has an agricultural bias could be without some exposure to Bayer. Okay. Let's mm -hmm. speak briefly also maybe about food production from the oceans. The oceans yep. being completely overfished. They are a massive part of, of, of what we consume. Uh, fish farming is yes, a growing indeed. industry. Is it there is. anything maybe a bit closer to home that people can invest into or at least look at? Well, of course, GMO seeds is one thing, but GMO fish or other animals is another thing because it, 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 it plays on all kinds of sensitivities that we have. Now, there's one uh, US company which is listed in London. Uh, it's called Aqua Bounty Technologies. And they have actually patented a breed of salmon whereby they've taken the growth hormone from the genome of the Chinook salmon and implanted it in the genome of the Atlantic salmon, which is the most common salmon used for fish farming. That sounds and like Frankenstein, <laughs> but potentially lucrative. The result is that you get a, a, an identical salmon to the one that we're used to. It smells the same, it looks the same, it has the same color, the same taste, but it grows twice as fast. So it'll be cheaper as well. It, potentially it will be cheaper, the, the, the output will be greater. Now, whether you would choose to eat that salmon, assuming that it is licensed by the FDA, is, is a question. Personally, I think I might. I, 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 have, I see no ethical objection to that. And that's a company that's listed on AIM? Or on it London is, Stock on Exchange? AIM, yes. Very good. Okay. More about all of this, because I think we've run out of time now and we've given our viewers a lot of background. More about this will be also in the free e-magazine that we publish every month. A uh, new issue is just out and Investing into Agriculture is our cover story. You can see it uh, on the screen right now. We are on masterinvestor.co.uk. You can download the magazine there for free and you can read more from Victor Hill every month and from a whole raft of other contributors who are putting the very best investment ideas and some very exciting and interesting background information together for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor, Thank as you, well, Sven. To, come, um, to come to this studio. And we always have a very interesting time speaking to you, and I learned a lot. Thank you. Bye.